Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2018 uh, John Fisher Zeidman Memorial Colloquium on Politics and the Press. My name is Phil Bennett. I am a professor at the Sanford School of Public Policy, which, along with the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, is a host uh, of this event. Um, before I introduce our panel, uh, I want to thank the Zeidman family uh, for making this discussion uh, possible. Philip and Nancy Zeidman started the Zeidman. Here's Philip Zeidman now. You come up. Philip and Nancy Zeidman started uh, the colloquium 34 uh, years ago um, uh, in memory of their son, John, a Duke student. Um, we at Duke have felt keenly uh, the loss of Nancy uh, over the last summer. Um, uh, she was so integral to this event, and her generosity, warmth, and grace uh, really touched everyone who's been associated with this, this event over the years. Um, I want to recognize Phil Zeidman here with us today, uh, Nancy and Phil's daughter, Jen, uh, Jennifer Zeidman Block, uh, her husband, Gene Block, and their children, Anna and John. Welcome. Um, we have three outstanding journalists with us today uh, to help, us guide us, help guide us through the maze of the midterms and uh, the sort of obstacle course uh, ahead of the country. Uh, and I'd like to introduce them briefly. Um, Yamiche Alcindor is the White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour and a contributor to NBC News and, and uh, MSNBC. Previously, she was a national reporter for the New York Times covering politics and social justice issues. Her reporting this fall has ranged from pre-election Florida to the tragedy in Pittsburgh uh, to last week's uh, chaos as usual White House press conference. Uh, Yamiche has a master's degree in broadcast news and documentary filmmaking from New York University and a degree in English, government and African-American studies from Georgetown. Uh, Frank Bruni is an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Since joining the Times more than two decades ago, Frank has been a White House correspondent, Rome bureau chief, a staff writer for the Times Magazine, and chief restaurant critic. Frank is, author of, uh, is the author of three best-selling books, including a classic on college admissions, where you go is not who you'll be. And I'm sorry if that book's too late for some of you. <laughs> it's, it's worth reading. Um, since uh, 2011, uh, Frank's twice-weekly column has covered politics, higher education, popular culture, and gay rights. This fall, he added a weekly newsletter to the mix. Frank is a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School and earned a degree in English from UNC Chapel Hill. Down. <laughs> actually, actually the, the, the applause is a good sign. Maybe the polarization is, is, uh, is healing. Uh, Catherine Miller is political editor for BuzzFeed News. Since joining BuzzFeed in 2013, she has written extensively about national politics and culture. Before that, Catherine was the managing editor for digital at the Washington Free Beacon. She has worked for the Student Free Press Association, a nonprofit group for college journalists and was a founding editor of the College Fix, which covers higher education. Catherine graduated from Vanderbilt University in 2010, also, also with a bachelor's degree in English. So you'd say, attention English majors, uh, careers available. Um, so let, let's get started. Uh, we're going to have a discussion up here for about 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll invite questions uh, from all of you. I'm going to, unfortunately, do something that I severely chastise students for, which is I'm going to periodically look at my phone because there's no clock in this room. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll try not to make a nuisance uh, of that. Um, so uh, let's start with the midterms. Um, Frank, uh, you wrote on, on election night under the memor memorable headline, the good, the bad, and the beto, that the results sent mixed and confusing signals. In the 11 days since, those signals have clarified some. Each of you reported out in the field at some point uh, with candidates and voters. If you were to each pluck a revelation or message from uh, the midterms that seems significant to capturing the state of the country, what would that be? Yamish, why don't we start with you? We are starting with Frank. Just name <laughs> Frank first. <laughs> I thought we were starting with you because he said your name. 
Um, <laughs> um, I would say the, revel the, the, the lesson of the midterms for me was that you don't just talk about diversity, you should actually have diversity. I remember covering Bernie Sanders, who was who I covered mainly in the 2016 election, and he would have a section of his of his speech dedicated to African Americans, dedicated to the immigrant population, dedicated to gays and lesbians, and that of course was good. That people liked the idea of him including all these groups. But I think the Democratic Party in 2018 was told, we don't just want you to talk about us, we want you to actually fund our campaigns and put money behind us. And there were there was in there was time after time. Um, where the Democratic Party would, would, would think that this is the person, the local groups might think that this is the person who's going to be um, the person who's going to kind of carry the torch of the Democratic Party and then realize actually this person who we kind of ignored as the person who won the race. I'm thinking of Lucy McBath, who was, you know, someone who's, who I, who I interviewed years ago when her son was murdered um, for playing loud music with his friends in a gas station and a white man shot into their car and killed her son because of that. He was then convicted of murder. And she channeled all that grief and all that anger in, in, into having now a political career. But I think that a lot of times, instead of having Lucy be the candidate, they would invite her to maybe be on a, a panel for them, or they might put her in a commercial. But to look at people and say, you as a 29-year-old bartender, you could be a candidate, I think that's something that the Democratic Party has learned this, um, this race. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think uh, it's. I think there are a lot of different lessons, and for almost every one that you could put out there, you could almost have someone contradict it with some other evidence. So I do think it's a sort of confusing mixed bag. But I think um, if there's one uh, message that voters sent above all others, or one lesson, it's that most American voters want the temperature turned down a lot in this country. Um, if you look particularly at those places where races were close, at those districts that flip from red to blue. Um, time and again, you saw candidates who were not taking a page from Donald Trump in terms of the way they addressed the electorate. Um, you, if you went to their events, and I did have the privilege of going out in the country a lot here in North Carolina, for example, I spent some time in the district where Dan McCready very narrowly lost. If you went to those events, voters talked way less about Donald Trump than you would have expected, um, and they weren't looking for their candidates um, to adopt his sort of truculence, you know, to echo it. Um, they wanted the temperature turned down. They liked hearing about collaboration and compromise. Um, they really yearn for a Washington that works and that doesn't simply bicker. Um, and I think there, there are two big questions facing the Democratic Party going forward into 2020, or two big tensions in the party. One is, the, is on the ideological spectrum, progressive to, to slightly more moderate. But the other big tension is, is captured in that sort of Eric Holder when they go uh, you know, when they go low, we kick them, or et cetera. I think the party has a decision to make about the emotional temperature of the candidate they nominate. And I think voters in the midterm said, have said, we do not want Donald Trump's liberal mirror image. We want something more inspiring. So I think kind of with, within the space of the conflicting messages, like the, which I assume we'll get a little bit more into, um, I think there has been a little bit of a tendency to say that, um, for instance, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, Andrew Gillum in Florida, Beto O'Rourke in Texas, um, some people have received their results positively, some have negatively, but like, I think it's actually a pretty positive thing for people in the Democratic Party who want candidates who are campaigning more as progressives or more as liberals. For a long time, Republicans have made the argument uh, like spanning decades that you want to, you know, campaign you know, bold colors, not pale pastels, and those those campaigns were like straightforwardly liberal campaigns. They were not. Kirsten Cinema obviously won in in Arizona as a candidate who was trying to persuade a a, a set block of maybe on the fence like Republican leading independents, and that was successful. But she didn't do that much better than Gillum or Abrams or O'Rourke, and in fact, like Abrams did better than any Democrat has done in Georgia in a really long time. And that seems, it, cer it certainly didn't disprove the idea that Democrats can run as, as true blue progressives I, in, my, in statewide races. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be examined quite a bit by prospective 2020 campaigns in the next couple of months, of like how, how exactly those campaigns did in those states. Yeah. Let's apply some of those. Um those messages to uh, the turnout, which was, among other things was one of the things that really um, distinguished the election as being unusual. So 49% uh, turnout, the highest, 113 million voters, the highest in over 100 years. 
Uh, and some people have interpreted that as inconsistent with basically being a Trump referendum, uh, motivating both sides to go out and do that. But there were other factors involved uh, as well. What, what do you think uh, drove that sort of voter enthusiasm? I think it was two things. I think one, a big part of it was Trump. Um, I, when I went out on the campaign trail and I went to West Virginia, Florida, um, Orange County, California, um, Pittsburgh, people were talking a lot about Donald Trump. And I could ask them a question that would be like, you know, what's motivating you? What do you think about health care? And they'd be like, oh, well, I just can't stand the way Donald Trump talks. And you're like, wait, I just asked you about health care. <laughs> but it's because people, I think people are so in tuned in the news, both either entertained if you're a Republican and seeing someone kind of stick it to Washington in a way that you wanted, including sticking it to the establishment Republican Party, or you're a Democrat who in some ways I felt feels like, felt traumatized by Hillary Clinton's loss and just needed to be watching kind of cable TV to give you some understanding of what was going to be, what was happening in the country. So I think Donald Trump, everybody was watching the news, I think, a little bit more closely. Um, people in Miami, where I'm from, where that would usually talk about the latest Drake concert, were then somehow live tweeting James Comey's testimony. <laughs> so I think there was all this, there was all this energy there with all the things that were happening in Washington. I think the second thing is that Democrats talking about health care, I think, actually worked in their favor in that everyone was talking about health care. So even if you were a Republican, you were talking about the fact that you wanted pre-existing conditions to be something that wouldn't cost you an arm and a leg for health care. So I think that they, the Democrats had some success in having, in having people talk about health care in a way um, that I hadn't seen in the past. I want to come back to Florida in a minute, but either of you want to address the sort of turnout question and what was, what was driving voters out there? I think there's been saturation over the last two years of politics. Like, I mean, it, it, in terms of a continuous campaign, I think we've sort of been in We've sort of been at the elevated, like the last few months of a presidential campaign, no matter who's running, are always going to be a little, like people People get into arguments about things they didn't even, positions they don't even necessarily hold, and like they say things they don't mean, and all kinds of stuff, but we've sort of been in that space now for like two year, two plus years. So of course people are going to vote, like I, I just think there's just such a immersion in politics. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the, the Texas campaign, for instance, you know, 8 million people voted in Texas. Um, the Aurora, the Cruz campaign had had modeled it to be 6 million, which would be a big turnout, too. Um, but if you hear about something all year long, I think you're just much more likely to be engaged, and I think that that's a big part of it. Can we come back to your point about um, uh, turning the heat down? So one of the lessons that you could pull from this is that the country is pulling apart, even, because mm -hmm. you have things going in different directions. You have the Senate going one way. A lot of state houses, a lot of statewide elections still trending uh, Republican, uh, and uh, then what happened on the Democratic side. And you can map a lot of these fissures between rural and urban areas, gen huge gender gap, um, uh, college degree versus non-college degree. How, how do you um, square that tendency with what you're describing earlier as a sort of um, uh, longing for uh, civility, comedy, whatever that well, feels I think, like. I think people's, affiliate, people's affiliations with parties can get stronger. Mm -hmm. um, people's attachment to whatever, wherever they are on the ideological spectrum can get more intense. It doesn't necessarily mean they want to hear that articulated mm -hmm. the way Donald Trump articulates what he articulates. And I think, you know, uh, it pains me to go back to Beto O'Rourke because no one was more overcovered and overwritten about. But in fact, I think so much about this election and so many of the questions that we need to ask going forward are refracted through that campaign. So Beto O'Rourke, yes, was unabashedly progressive um, in almost every way. I don't think that was why his campaign was as successful as it was. It was a piece of it. But if you went to his rallies, and I went to many of them, if you interviewed him, and I interviewed him at length twice, um, if you talked to people about him, it was his spirit. It was the fact that they took away from him a sort of optimism. Even as he was being very critical on the merits, on the points, um, of what Republicans were doing and of what Donald Trump was doing, he didn't come across as someone you know, who wanted to beat them to a pulp. He came across as someone who was just asking us all to think about a better way. And he was constantly making bipartisan gestures. There was that whole long road trip that he took with Will Hurd, who's still in one of the most, un who's, who's still in one of the few unresolved house races against Gina Ortiz Jones in that very interesting area of Texas. Um, so I, d I don't think it's really a contradiction at all. And I think if you look at better work, you see the way in which it cannot be a contradiction. 
It sounds to me is a you came you've come out of this experience uh, optimistic about sort of the state of democracy and oh no not at all no. okay fine good <laughs> I just want to get that clear <laughs> no but I think <laughs> well one thing about that though is that I, you can't look at the house map and not say that there was like a real that the 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 split really is a suburban split and then and you see that across states and you see that in unusual places you see that in Oklahoma in Utah it looks like it's going to break for for Mia Love, ultimately, probably, but like in places that, um, you know, the, the Democrats picked up seats in suburban Houston and suburban D uh, Dallas, um, suburban Denver, suburban Atlanta, where Lucy McBath won. Um, that is probably, I mean, a few friends and I have been talking about this, and one thing that someone is saying is that it could be a corrective for 2016 where people thought they were voting for Hillary Clinton and a Republican check on Hillary Clinton, but those are re traditionally Republican leaning areas and that is, you know, like a, a, the, the sort of like, you know, reductive view of the suburban voter, right, is that they, that is a core person who wants a slightly different, right, like is not uh, the target audience for Donald Trump's rhetoric. Back to democracy, I think, as a group before we're done today. Let, um, let, let me, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit off your diversity comments about uh, the role of women in the election. So you had a record number of women running, 256 candidates, and not, not just women, but women of color, women of all sorts of different groups all across the country. And women not only participating as candidates, but donors, volunteers, all sorts of things. Then you have a record number of women coming into to Congress. Was that, um, was that born of 2016? Was that, what should we make of that? And we'll turn a little bit into sort of what's gonna mean for Washington now that those uh, newly minted Congress uh, members are there. But how did you read that during the campaign uh, cycle? What was going on? It, it might be because I'm a White House reporter, but it's also, but I, a lot of women either really, really didn't like Donald Trump or were trying to prove that Donald Trump did have female voters or women voters, and as a result, um, that, that, that they were going to support him. I will say that I think the president, because he stands accused of sexual misconduct himself by several women, um, that that has, I think that that motivated a lot of women and was on a lot of women's minds um, that I talked to when they thought about who they were going to be voting for. I also think the Me Too movement and having a conversation about sexual assault um, got a lot of people talking in their own homes to their husbands, to their brothers, to their children about things that happened to them um, that I think also spurred women to become more active. I also think women, some of the women that I talked to were just fed up with, with the way that Congress looked. You, you look at can Congress, you look at, you know, who was, who was, there were all these like meetings about the Judiciary Committee when the Dr. Ford thing happened, that they had to hire a female lawyer, a woman lawyer to question Dr. Ford because there were no women available. And you had se oh, senators openly wondering whether or not women even want the, to do the hard work of the Judiciary Committee, as if women have a question about whether or not women want to do hard work. I, so, I, so I think there's this idea that women were watching this and saying, what is going on? If you're a Democrat, I also think even if you're a, a woman Republican, the people that I that I interviewed that were um, most cautious about Donald Trump were w women re Republican voters who were saying, either one, I'm really annoyed with, with the fact that they're trying to turn Donald Trump into being a misogynist when I know he's not. And I talked to a lot of women who said, well, he speaks just like my husband, just like my brother, just like my father. So why is this any worse? So I think there were a lot of women who were angered at that idea that like, why can't we just normalize what President Trump says? And I think, on the, like I said, on the, on the flip side, there were a lot of very angry Democratic women. And I should say, when we talk about the diversity of these midterms and these candidates, almost all of the diversity is on the Democratic side. I remember the Republican Party of maybe now five years ago where they had this big report after, where, where they were saying, we have to broaden our base, we have to go after women and people of color. Donald Trump comes along, wins the nomination, doing the exact opposite of what the report said to do. And now I think the Republican Party is trying to figure out if they want to be that Republican Party uh, to broaden their base or if they just go in and, and really focus on getting voter turnout for the people that they have. A new autopsy. Yeah. Or say, how would they do it? So let's stay with the Republicans uh, for a minute and just because there were areas where they showed real strength. They took back some uh, statewide elections from Democrats, uh, some uh, Senate seats. 
Uh, and um, uh, at least there were signs sort of anecdotally that Trump going out onto in, and, and campaigning really uh, helped energize uh, voters. What, what kind of lessons are, are there signs of encouragement that the Republicans can take from the midterms and, uh, and say this is teaching us something about where the country's at? Um, you know, maybe uh, less of a protest vote for us and more of a vote of affirmation. Yeah, we are on your side. We're not just voting against the other side. What, what kind of, Frank, what would you say about what the Republicans can take away from this? Well, I mean, they, there's definitely some good they can take away. I think they're extremely excited about uh, maintaining the governorship in Ohio, mm -hmm. which Democrats wanted badly and put a lot of effort behind. I mean, they remain the way this is. Uh, the Democrats made huge gains in governorships, and I think that hasn't been written about enough because I was looking at that just this morning and looking at the states now that are governed by Democrats, and I haven't done the arithmetic, but I'm pretty sure that many, many more Americans are living under Democratic governors, even though the number is only 23, because 10 of the 15 most populous states in the country now have Democratic governors. But, you know, Texas, they held on to that Senate seat. Ohio, they held, that to that, held on to that governor seat. Florida. They're clearly going, they've clearly held on to that governor's seat, and they're going to hold on to that Senate seat. Um, I think, though Yamish put her finger on it, they've got a real problem here, which is um, there is a short-term strategy that Donald Trump pursued, which is to just maximize the love from a very particular slice of the population. And that could work for them again in 2020. That is what worked for them in those places where they fared well. It's not a strategy that's going to keep working eight years, 12 years, 16 years into the future. It's, it's guaranteed death eventually for all the reasons that that autopsy, autopsy mentioned. And I mean, they're aware of that. And you saw that in just yesterday, the Times had a fascinating story by um, my colleagues Maggie Haberman and, and uh, Katie Rogers about Trump going around and constantly asking people, should I replace my, uh, is Mike Pence loyal enough to me? Is Mike Pence loyal enough to me? And part of that conversation is, should he maybe be replaced on the ticket? Now that probably won't happen because that this is a common theme in presidential administrations where there's a moment, Barack Obama had it, where he was thinking of putting in Hillary Clinton, or where people were talking, should we sub in Hillary Clinton for Joe Biden? But in that Pence conversation was a feeling, should we see if maybe we could get Nikki Haley to join the ticket? Isn't Mike Pence too much an echo of the support we already have? And if we're going to broaden it all, wouldn't someone else's running mate make sense? So the Republican Party is very aware of that tension. It's just for now, they seem to have resolved it by saying we are just going to make white men love us all the more. In a way, with these elections, I mean, you were in Texas. You were with Ted Cruz in Texas. In some ways, that whole scene just crystallizes the extent to which uh, it's really Trump's party. And uh, so that even, you know, Ted Cruz meeting with Donald Trump Jr., you were in that, that kind of scene. Or is that not, not, is that not what you felt? No, I mean, I think it is. I mean, it's Trump's party. It was Trump took out the nomination and it became Trump's party. Um, and that was, it was such a unique thing that it is going to change the character of the party and the way that, that the 2016 election was won in terms of the upper Midwest suddenly become, I mean, the, the long trail of the last few years, right, is that people have talked about states like Arizona and Georgia uh, potentially becoming Democratic states and eventually Texas. Like, that's the, you kind of come down um, on either side while the, the Midwest probably becomes more Republican um, as it's more older and whiter. Um, and that's sort of that sort of happened in 2016, and so that's sort of reshaped, I think, how people think about things. Trump is the president, and and you know, Cruz knows this better than anyone. That like you basically on most policy issues, he has basically um, agreed with Trump, supported Trump on everything, with the exception of trade. Um, he's also begun to sort of nod in the direction of some of the fringier elements that have supported. Uh, Donald Trump, like he defended Alex Jones's um, position on Facebook this year as a First Amendment issue. It's not a First Amendment issue, or it's a you know it's a you have to change your change how we understand the First Amendment to consider it one. Um, he's also sort of you know the way that he talked about uh, there was this the the terrible shooting in Dallas where the man was killed inside of his apartment by an off duty police officer. The way Cruz has talked about that, and the way that he sort of signaled to voters about the way Beto O'Rourke had spoken about it was is is very much in that sort of identity politics that Trump does. Like he has selected of Trump's um, approach to politics, the identity politics uh, lane of it. And that's kind of the direction of some, I mean, that that is a sort of, if that kind of identitarian politics on the right bothers you, that's a troubling sign that Ted Cruz is kind of like, well, maybe this is like the way to do some of this. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, in general, though, like if like a Ted Cruz rally this year was like actually about low taxes and less regulation. It was not that. It was very like what you would have heard at a Republican rally five years ago. It's just some of the national stuff has been a little bit different, I think. Let's uh, just come back to Florida for a second as the resident Floridian on the panel. You can explain the state to us. Um, uh, so you, you also canvassed there. I mean, you mean in the sense of you reported a lot on the street. You talked to people on both sides. Uh, uh, were the results what you'd expected, having been there for a little bit reporting? Or what, what do you think explains what's happening in Florida? Florida is Florida. <laughs> and it, it, Floridians always say that, but. Uh, and we all know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I am shocked that Florida is still in this like recount idea that like we changed the ballots. We put we have whole probably meetings about these ballots, and yet again we're we're faced with another another race where people are wondering if the ballot was designed wrong, if people understand how to vote essentially in in Florida. Um, I'm not surprised by the outcomes because. Florida demographics are such that it really is a swing state and that it's almost it's almost split in that um, you have this older population, mostly of white people, who are not gonna th that are that are constantly replenishing themselves. People are constantly retiring to Florida. So it's not like it's a population that's gonna go away anytime soon. So it's like that's gonna be there for a long time. And then you have these younger African American or people of color, um, who who are also who are being targeted in some ways for either voter suppression or just are busy in their lives and are and are having to be convinced that you should really go to the polls and spend two hours there because the ballots are are slow and we still can't figure out how to get these lines down. So I think that it's it's always going to be a toss up. And I did a story on Florida demographics and literally the Democratic pollsters were like, it's going to be all about turnout. We have we don't feel good. We don't feel like it's going to be. Um, something that we that that you can at all predict. I will say quickly there was a I as part of my reporting, I went to this gated community um, in Florida and it was like the nicest gayest community I've ever seen. And it was it's a retirement community and I was sitting there talking to these nice older women um, who were like talking about knitting peacock feathers and out of nowhere they start talking about the fact that like Puerto Ricans shouldn't even be able to vote because they're not really American. And that caravan is going to come and bring diseases to this neighborhood. So, you know, we don't want those people here. And it reminded me that, like, people can be very pleasant with their bigotry. And people can be very, very people that you, and, and there's no other way to put it. Like, I think as a reporter, you have to say, like, if you think that fundamentally Puerto Ricans don't have a right to vote, but you think Irish and Germans and all these other people who look alike but are different na different nationalities, that they somehow have a better, they somehow have a, a birthright to this country, but the people that are brown and are coming in a little bit later are somehow the problem, then that's bigotry. And I think that um, that is something that's striking, but I think it's something that was so easy to, for them to say and express on camera to me um, that that told me that Florida had, Florida's going to be a toss-up state for a long time because of that. Fascinating. One thing that just quickly on Florida for the, for the reason of of the population changing there that has surprised me is I really, I've like all year, I thought that, especially after Andrew Gillum kind of barely won his primary. He, it was like a split primary one, I think with like 35% of the vote over Gwen Graham. Um, and ran as like, you know, basically the, the, like the Bernie candidate. That's how he was, I mean, he was really running as like the, as like a, as a lefty candidate. I was like, oh, well, that's probably gonna be like a six, seven point loss. In Florida this year, because that's that's kind of where I would expect Trump. Trump's most popular with older with the, with exactly the kind of voter who's really reliable and comes out and votes in Florida. And you know, uh, DeSantis is DeSantis was a flawed candidate, obviously for a variety of reasons. Um, but you know, Rick Scott was on the ballot. You know, people like him. But those races were really close. Like I don't know that it, it just kind of went against what I thought. I thought it was just going to be like that would be the exception. You saw some hidden strength there. Yeah, or something. I don't know. But it, it just it surprised me by being closer than I was expecting. But it also but Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, but like I think of the Florida governor's race and the fact that people came down and were talking about monkeying it up yeah. and that there, there were these robocalls, like it became so much about race. Yes. Um that to me it was there was no denying that that became and 
when you drive through Florida, I'm from Miami. Miami is this place where it's almost like growing up abroad, I say. You have people from all different cultures. You can eat all types of food. I could speak English or I could speak Creole all day, which is my, my other language that I speak. And my mom learned Spanish just by like being there, literally. She's a social worker and now she can do her job in Spanish just by eating Cuban sandwiches at the corner for 25 years. So it's one of those places where you get that, but then you start driving north and you're like, oh, that's, we're living in like a different, it's almost like a different state. You start driving north and north and you're realizing that people are like, well, why does that person have that accent? And you're like, wait, I'm sorry, why, why are you upset that someone speaks Spanish? And you realize that it's just a completely different state. It almost could be two states. Well, I just wanted to pivot off something Catherine said, which I think one thing I think we often forget to take into account when we're trying to draw big lessons from these various races. When we look at who won and who lost in the margin and we say, okay, well, this person was advocating this basket of policies, this person was this far to the left or right, candidates matter. So DeSantis was a terrible candidate, right? So when we're figuring out what Andrew Gillum's performance, which was usually impressive, means, we have to keep in mind that he was a great candidate and DeSantis was a terrible candidate. And you can go to other races like that. There's a lot of talk in this past week about Sherrod Brown, and maybe he's the best Democratic candidate in 2020 because, look, he prevailed in Ohio at the same time you know, that the Democratic gubernatorial candidate lost, et cetera. He was running against a hugely flawed, much inferior candidate. Um, and when we're making these big lessons, it has not ceased to be the case, even in a country where a lot of votes are already predetermined in a partisan direction, you still see people prevailing or, or being defeated based on how good they are as candidates. Colin Allred in, the Dal in Dallas and a bit of its suburbs, fantastic candidate. And that, I think, more than the blue wave was why he prevailed over Pete Sessions the way he did. And I just hope Democrats going into 2020 do not get so, you know, do not get so absorbed in progressive versus moderate, uh, male versus female, black versus white, et cetera, and just kind of really take a hard look at the field and say, who really breaks through? Who has got, forgive me for using the word, conventional charisma? Hillary Clinton didn't have that in two th 2016, and it mattered. Let's, let's turn then to the new members of Congress arriving in Washington. They arrived last week, the largest uh, Democratic freshman class uh, since 1974 in the Watergate era. And so, Frank, let me just stick with you for a second. What, what are the Democrats going to do now that they've taken the House? What, what is that? Well, who's gonna, going to lead gonna, them? They're going to fight a lot. Yeah, OK, so let's, <laughs> is, is this a sort of 2010 moment for them, and they're going to go through something similar to what the Republicans went through? With, or? Well, it's interesting you ask that, because a lot of people are asking whether sort of the most progressive um, newcomers are going to be a kind of freedom caucus where they're going to make it difficult for the Democratic caucus all in all to reach any sort of kind of consensus because they're going to hold out um, as their constituents maybe voted them, you know, wanted them to do when they voted for them. Um, I mean, I think, it, you know, there are a number of fights coming up. First, it's the Nancy Pelosi fight. I think she's going to end up being the next speaker. I think she deserves to be, but there's going to be a little bit of drama before that happens. I, I think that's going to quickly recede and it's not going to matter a bunch in terms of 2020. The thing that I think will matter more um, is can they find the sweet spot um, between performing their correct sort of function, their oversight function, as pertains to the Trump administration and, and Donald Trump himself, without turning this into a sort of subpoena palooza that makes, uh, that makes many voters who want the temperature turned down feel like they have just changed the nature um, of, the, of the vitriol in DC, but not done anything to actually um, remove some of it. So thread that needle for a moment. So you're, you're now, uh, you've been sent in part to uh, have a check on the executive, and yet you don't want to turn it into sort of Circus Maximus. Uh, how do you do that? I don't know. I'm, I'm glad I'm not paid to do that. I would. Yeah. You actually I, are I think paid to. <laughs> no, and I think and I think it's important that we say it's a tough call because all of us, you know, write what we write or we sit on TV and say what we say, and we're great at um, we're great at criticizing people for doing it the wrong way. But you know, we don't have the answers either. Um, so I don't know how you thread that needle, but I know you've got to pay a lot of attention to that question. And as you go along, keep asking yourself, um, is this consistent with the core questions, the core mission? I mean, maybe you sit down and you make a list. Here are the, here are the, the corruptions, the violations, the infractions, um, the abnormalities of this administration that really, really matter to the body politic. And here's the stuff that is just titillating. Let's focus on this. Okay. 
Is there a, a you know, we, uh, 2010, a group of Republicans come in, have, have a fundamentally different way of thinking about what the party should be, how it should position itself. I'm not sure if it's an ideological difference or, or just a way of thinking about the party is, and this uh, unchains the whole uh, fight over the speakership, eventually John Boehner's uh, departure, et cetera. Are the Democrats in an analogous situation? Is the caucus as divided between progressives and moderates as, say, the Republican Party was at an earlier phase? I mean, I do think one of the takeaways from this year, right, is that this class is actually, for all the, it's eased off a little bit this year, but certainly last year there was a lot of fighting about the kinds of candidates that Democrats should be running. Um, you do have like a pretty wide swath of, of people who are coming into Congress. You have someone like Rashida Tlaib in the Detroit suburb, or in Detroit, who's taken the Conyers seat, um, who's Palestinian uh, American activist. Um, you have Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, obviously, who everyone knows about now. Um, they're very progressive. You also know, though, with like Connor Lamb is back in Congress, Abby Finkenauer in, in Iowa, they're, they seem a little bit more like. Kind of 70s throwbacks, like kind of pro-union, sort of Catholic, kind of that kind of um, that kind of political figure, and like they're they, they all fit their districts basically. They all fit their districts really well. Um, how that all interacts together, I don't know. Um, when the Tea Party took over, I mean, that's there's there's some debate about whether that is how much of that was ideological and how much it wasn't. I don't think, I think there's probably a divide between what voters wanted and what the, some of the, the lawmakers wanted. I think if you look at somebody like Michael Lee, who's like a pretty principled, has a pretty ordered set of views um, that he has applied since being elected in 2012, I think, or maybe it was 2010. Um, and then you have some people who are kind of the, the impulse of that, I think people took away the, certain kinds of conservatives would do well in the 2016 primary. And that didn't happen because what voters were more interested in, or at least some slice of voters were more interested in basically kind of like an anti-establishment style. Um, and that that's all kind of like a big like tree of different things that might happen over the next few years. I don't think, I don't expect the Congress to be doing anything over the next two years. I expect the like Democratic House to probably pass some like gun control legislation and that kind of stuff that the Senate won't do. And then the Senate will like confirm judges. Yeah. I'll just do this. I think Donald Trump likes his fight. And if he if if I think it's a it's a delicate balance between the media and I would say between um, Democrats to kind of be in the ring with Donald Trump while also trying to do trying trying to define who they are. Um, so I think that that's something that Democrats have to think about. President Trump might like the idea that like, okay, you're gonna launch 1,800 investigations, so then every single time I can go I can go to a rally after rally and say, well, I would love to turn the government back on, but these Democrats, all they want to do is get my tax returns. Um, if people, you know, if, if the, for Democrats, you have to understand that, like, Hillary Clinton already went, ran the, like, anti-Trump kind of campaign, and that, and you wonder if, if Democrats want to spend all their time doing that. I, I saw this morning or last night that the president tweeted his support for Nancy Pelosi, mm. to, uh, <laughs> she deserved the job. So, so there you go. Let, let's talk a little bit about how uh, Trump has reacted uh, to the elections, how he's come out of it. Uh, obviously, Jeff Sessions is gone, Matt Whitaker in, a number of things. And then, uh, and then very shortly after, of course, the, the, the press conference and the back and forth that you were involved in, bringing the, you know, the media up, Jim Acosta, all of those things. Let, um, I guess I would ask two questions. One is, what's your sense of sort of how President Trump has, has processed what's happened over the last uh, 11 days? And then I think as we have the, the benefit of your presence here, you know, take us through a little bit what happened at the press conference, how you... Um, how you dealt with it, how you think, what you think was going on there when he, he uh, chose to speak to you that way and, and, and help us understand where that relationship with the press might be going. Well, I was at the White House the day of the midterm elections and Kellyanne Conway came out and gave a 28 minute press conference. And I knew that right then and there that the, that the White House was feeling good about these results because they were talking to reporters all night. I was there from six, mm -hmm p.m. to 1 a.m. and constantly getting news from, and this is a place where you get a, a White House press briefing maybe once a month now. Um, so they were in a good mood. So 
fast forward the next day and President Trump comes out and he starts, he opens up by making fun of Mia Love and all these Republicans. And I've heard this from voters on both sides. President Trump is somewhat entertaining to watch, mm -hmm. even if people hate to say that or hate to admit that. So he's so people are kind of chuckling when he's like mm. saying all these things. But of course, when it comes to Q and A time, there are real questions. Like you, there are Democrats, there are Republicans that you endorsed that lost. That your caravan, you had a caravan ad that was racist and that, or I should say that that was deemed as racist, um, and that people then that Fox News and NBC and CNN wouldn't actually run because they deemed it too racist. So. All that was going on. So he, so as he got to, to to taking questions, of course, he started getting in in with it with Jim Acosta, Peter Alexander. He actually started physically pacing at the podium. If you guys were not watching this live, and I was like, oh my god, he's going to tackle Jim Acosta. I was just that's the one thing where I was like, oh my god, this is going to be this is this is not going to be good. And I'm like row five, wondering like, please call on me. I need this. I really want to ask my questions. And I have like a list of questions, and I'm going through them, and like they're being asked, so I'm like going through. And finally, he calls on me once, and he forgets that he called on me, so he goes to someone else, and he calls on me again and forgets again that he called on me. So I just like start I just stood up the whole time. And I say all that because I think um, when you're watching it on TV, people might think reporters are being rude when they stand up or they're interrupting, but it's literally the way the room works. Like he'll point at you, and then some other person will speak up, and he'll just like forget that he pointed at you. So you have to physically stand up. So by the time I get around to it, I kind of know that he's not in a good mood. But I asked the question that I want to ask because one, I've not just been, I'm, I'm not asking, are you emboldening white, white nationalists just because I'm a black woman, which I think needs to be said. I'm asking it because he literally had ads that were deemed too racist by his favorite network. We have white supremacists that I've interviewed who say he's, they are more excited about President Trump than past presidents. You have David Duke, constantly tweeting his support. And just the same day that I asked the question, a white supremacist was tweeting about being at the White House. So that's the context with, which in which that question was, was asked. And as soon as, of course, I started asking my question, he starts interrupting me. But I've been taught as a journalist that you press on. You're, you're there to do your job. You're there to finish your thought. You're there to hold, it, hold officials accountable. So I finished my thought. And at the end of the day, I'm not there to argue with the president. I, my question is my question. And your response is going to be your response. Um, and I will say personally, I was inspired to become a journalist because of the story of Emmett Till. It's a 14 year old boy who was murdered in Mississippi. That's at the core of why I became a journalist. That's what keeps me steady. It's what reminds me of my job. It reminds me of my privilege to, to ask questions. So I, I rarely get rattled and I've been to things like Ferguson and Baltimore and I've covered Trayvon Martin's death and the trial of George Zimmerman. So I've been through a lot. I'm young, but I've been through all these different things that I think readied me for the moment to say, I don't, I'm going to press forward with my question. And that was what was going through my mind. It was, you're here to do a service. Um, and I followed it up with, a, with what people would say is a boring question about middle class tax cuts because I have a job to do and you're not going to rattle me off of my job. And I think that he had to answer my second question. Um, and I felt like, I felt proud of myself for just being like, I can get through this and ask that question without feeling like I need to be in the ring fighting the president. That's not my style personally. Um, and I think that I feel good about how that happened because of that. What? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Bravo. As somebody who's, whose job it is to understand the president, to understand the White House, to try to figure out and, and, and place him both in history and, of, and in the day. Why do you think that he said that to you? I think I've talked to White House aides afterwards, and they said that he was really offended by the question because, he, because the, there are people within the White House that are very, very, very not happy about the fact that he gets um, accused of being emboldening white ra white nationalists, white supremacists. Um, so I think that he he said that because he really, really, really didn't like the question, and because he felt like he was being misunderstood. I also think he said that because he had already been amped up after arguing with all these other reporters um, and pacing on this on on pacing at the podium that he was in a mindset where he was angry. Um, and I think that that's part of the reason why he, why he did that. 
Let me just ask you about Acosta since you're in that briefing room and he's a colleague of yours on, the, on a similar beat. Really happy to be back at work. Yeah, I, I imagine. <laughs> How do you, so, you know, lots happened with that. This, his pass was reinstated, but of course, uh, the judge really didn't pick up the, 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 the bigger questions of the First Amendment surrounding that. And the Department of Justice made the argument uh, that the White House uh, can, uh, has the right to determine who comes in and, and, and goes out and tried to make that into more than just a norm of acting in the White House, but uh, you know, uh, something more formal than that. Um, so um, I guess my question is, do you feel like there are um, uh, ways in which the White House would like to take this beyond uh, rhetoric, beyond what the president says in his sort of, um, in his rhetoric about the press and start to, uh, or threaten to impose real restrictions on, uh, important restrictions on the way the president's covered? I mean, the president and Sarah Sanders says, both say that they are coming up with new rules and regulations for press conferences and for decorum at the White House. He said the word decorum. <laughs> um, so we'll have to see what that looks like. And we'll have to see if both, if both reporters and the president can hold on to that sense of decorum and, and, and work within these rules. I'm not sure what the rules are going to look like. So I, I feel like it's premature for me to say whether or not they're going to try to curtail things. But the president said you can't get up there and ask three to four questions. And he often sometimes answers three to four questions from a reporter. So it's not as if he, if you ask him questions that he likes, he might let you ask three or four questions. It's just that if he doesn't like the question that you're asking, he might not let you ask even one question, which was the case in, with April Ryan, who screamed the word voter suppression or shouted the word voter suppression. The president heard it, started answering her question. She got up to, to finish the question, and he screamed at her to sit down. In any other sense, you would think that that was a reporter who heard you responding to her question and as a result was posing the question, which is an incredibly important question to ask. It's voter suppression. It's why Georgia, in a lot of ways, was, was, was something that was controversial. Um, it's that courts have shown, I would want to say in this state, that Republicans were targeting African Americans with precision. So it's not as if we're talking about something that happened a long time ago. We're talking about modern history, and the president kind of shouted her down and told her to sit down. I don't know if, what the rules are going to be, but if I, I, as a reporter, think that if the president starts answering my question, I'm going to finish my thought. Right. I mean, you know, throughout the campaign, they blocked reporters from entering events from different outlets they didn't like. They started doing that. The press process, the, separately from the Trump White House, the, getting a press pass at the White House is like a weirdly complicated and like sort of surrealist experience where like if you request it at one point, it, you might get it in a couple weeks, but like slightly later, it could take eight months, like it's a, getting the permanent ones. Um, and it's always been like that. It's very like opaque. Um, so there's a lot of like weird, so th which probably gives them a lot of latitude to do weird things with it, um, just like the weird procedural stuff. But like they have a history of just not letting people in when they don't want to. Um, where it becomes a public space as opposed to a campaign is that's when it gets more oh, the fraught. Department of Justice and more, involved yes. in drama yeah. theft. Frank, let me ask you sort of to step back on this a little bit because it's hard to come up with a universal theory about Trump and the press or what it all means and where it's all going. Um, you know, polling shows that on even after Pittsburgh and in other senses, you know, public opinion starts to divide on sort of who's more trustworthy, who incites violence uh, more, than, who divides the country more, the president or the news media. Um, uh, what's your sense about how, and of course Donald Trump has a long history of using uh, uh, his relations with the media in this strange symbiosis of both sort of high ratings and you mean like calling into the New York Post in the old days and pretending John Barron, to be a friend yeah. of Donald Trump's? <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a long. It's, maybe this is a work for a, a psychiatrist and not for a op-ed columnist. But I, you know, um, the uh, what, what's but seriously, what's your sense of whether or not the the fundamental role as perceived by people of the news media is being altered in important ways by the way that this contest is playing out? Well, I mean, for, first of all, I mean, Trump didn't go after the press just because he was getting negative coverage, although that was part of the motivation. He read the same opinion surveys that you've read in terms of how much, how, how what a small percentage of the public trusts the press, how we're not particularly well liked. And I think his, his, um, his MO has often been to find a group 
or a thing or an institution that might be even less liked than he is and beat up on that um, because in comparison he ends up coming out ahead. He also, I mean, none of this is done. He also realizes that if you completely delegitimize the media, if you completely delegitimize uh, the Mueller investigation, then he doesn't have to worry about the truth because the truth is whoever wins the argument you know, whoever does the best spin because you've now removed the credibility of the supposed independent arbiter of facts and the truth. Um, and, and now, yeah, I mean, it has become the situation where I don't know what it's going to look like after Donald Trump. I mean, the media has begun to behave differently because it has to to cover this president. Will that behavior be permanent or will it be a kind of one-off once this president is gone? Um, and some of our responses to this president, some of the ways in which we're adapting, I don't think are good for us. Um, well, I mean, I think it's fine. I think we were too slow to use the word lie and that sort of thing. But there are all sorts of, um, and now I'm moving beyond Trump, but there are all sorts of changes happening in, this, happening in the media landscape and the media economy that I don't think are going to help us build those trust numbers with Americans. Um, too many journalists now in a more European style wear a kind of ideological tag. And too many journalists, because of the way the media economy has gone, have essentially monetized that ideological tag. So you turn in... Journalists have contracts with various networks that are, in a sense, in an unspoken sense, dependent on them always giving a certain kind of answer. They're cast for a given segment of news because it is predictable that they will give a certain kind of answer. So they end up wedded to a certain kind of perspective and a certain kind of script in a way they may not even be aware of by economic incentives, by brand incentives. And I think in a sort of ambient way, the public picks up on that and doesn't doesn't always believe they're hearing a genuine discussion and senses somewhat correctly that they're hearing a sort of stage thing that is the sort of accretion of various people's vested interests. Yeah, I would, I would kind of disagree, mainly because, one, I have a contract and work for NBC and <laughs> MSNBC, um, but two, I have, because, a I have a contract with CNN. Yeah, I mean, you know. yeah, but two, it's also because I think as a black woman with an afro, I think people are going to perceive me in a way that looks like, oh, she must be a Black Lives Matter mole. And and that's going to be something that I'm going to wear no matter what TV station I end up on. I think for some of us that have been reporters, you've always had to deal with the fact that like you people perceive who you are and what you believe just by the virtue of who you are and, and the body that you um, are in. So I think that journalists being on TV, at least for me, and I would say for, for other people, for other straight news reporters, I think of Abby Phillips. She's someone who is very a very straight reporter. You can put her next to uh, two Republicans. You can put her next to two Democrats. You can put me on next to sitting next to Chris Matthews. He teases me all the time. You mean you're so straight of a reporter? Like I can't get anything out of you. And it's like, yeah, because I'm not gonna beat up on the president. Yes, did he say I was a racist? Question. Yeah, but does that mean I'm gonna beat up on him and say that he's the most terrible person in the world? That's not my job. So I think that as, but as I, I don't I don't I don't disagree. With you. We're, ta we're talking about like when you when you're talking about the TV landscape, yeah. there are two populations on it. There are the straight reporters like you and Abby, and I think they are doing an extraordinary job. I think you're doing an extraordinary job. But a lot of what fills the airwaves is the me's. You know, oh, yeah. the people who are paid for commentary. Oh, well, yeah. And I think and I think that's a lot of what, what viewers are hearing. And I think they see us mm -hmm. as people who are not necessarily giving them a straight version of events, but are giving them the version of events that we're paid to give. I think it's just a complicated media landscape. There's been an explosion. It's just like fracturing in terms of what you're actually consuming. And it's very tough to know what some what someone else is consuming. I think intellectually, everyone knows that what you see on Facebook is going to be pretty different than what someone else sees on Facebook, just scrolling through. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a mother and a daughter. The daughter was a big Bernie Sanders supporter. The mother um, supported was a Republican. I don't remember if she was like a Trump supporter necessarily. but. They're both from the same town in Louisiana. The daughter had moved away. They're lots of friends in common. They're, what they saw on a daily basis was just totally divergent. And, you know, that's it's tough to know what, like, you know, over the last 60 years, the there's just been a big splintering. In a lot of ways, that's, it, there's trades. It's, it's, a, it's like an economics curve moving. There's a lot of pros in this, in this person. Ugh. There's a lot of pros in this particular news economy where you are able to get, if you are like a real progressive, you're able to read The Intercept and get news that's much more what you're interested in. There's definitely been an absolute change that's very important in the kinds of journalists that are covering national politics now. Um, Latino readers, black readers were very underserved in the kind of news consumption they're getting. Younger readers were too. I mean, I don't think a lot of straight news 
that you necessarily saw like 20 years ago would have been written with like a 25 year old woman in mind. Like I just don't think that was necessarily the case. Not that you're that anyone's writing for a, a particular reader. Um, so you're getting a lot more choice. You're getting a lot more things tailored to what you, you know, are interested in and what is important. But there's also just like much more variance there, and that's a, it's just tough for anybody to keep track of, say, the national news when there's just a lot more. The economics have changed, I think, for a lot of people. Um, as we're burning through our time, uh, let's turn uh, to 2020 for a moment, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions from the, the audience. And, and Catherine, maybe I'll stay with you. And I, I don't really. I'm going to formulate the question while I speak. <laughs> but I wanted to reference something that you wrote that I thought was interesting about. So next year marks the first time that uh, Americans born after 9-11 will be able to vote. And whether or not, you know, among the various sort of symbolic, you know, changings of the guard, what that means is hard to say. Uh, but it certainly means that new points of reference uh, come into uh, prominence uh, based on what your personal experiences or received experience. Um, and the 9-11 uh, moment was obviously one that people used as a point of reference to determine their political identity. So having said all that, as you look towards 2020, uh, just from a generational point of view, are there, are there different markers? Does that say something or allow you to sort of interpret what might happen over the next two years to produce a... Well, a couple, a couple quick ones on this is one is one interesting common thread with a lot of the new Congress is you actually like if you look at the names of some of the people who are elected, it's like Katie and Andrew and Jared. Um, <laughs> it's like a very young group of people that are like between like age like 28 and like 38. There's like an actual like mullet and that had happened a little bit in the previous years. But um, so that's, I think, one thing that's shifting. You also have like another wave of people. I think when we have a reporter um, who's 23, who's been covering a lot of um, like kind of the democratic socialist kind of area of the politics um, and also sort of justice Democrats and, and some of this, the more like inter like obviously a big thing in the wake of Bernie Sanders is making that more intersectional. Um, trying to figure out where you have like cla where class and race are a little bit more to come together for progressive politics, and I think Alexandria Ocasio Cortez would be sort of a central um, player in that uh, that argument. Um, one thing that is definitely true of people who are in politics, I think, that are twenty three versus people who are maybe in their early thirties uh, and went through the grad graduated or were very young adults in the financial and the crisis and the recession is it's a much more positive group of people that are the younger people. Um, so I think that's probably a, a slight di different little generational shift. 9-11 was obviously a big formative thing for a lot of millennials, but also it just changed, it obviously changed dramatically the contours of the Bush presidency. And then the way the Bush presidency has reverberated, you probably wouldn't have Obama without Bush. You probably, I don't know if necessarily if you'd have Trump without Obama, but like those things are all part and parcel, and that we certainly were having the, you know, it's like Trump. Everyone can kind of pick their worst moment of the last few years. Um, <laughs> there's a big variety of them that you can pick from, but uh, uh, the Trumps, like you know, the dancing Muslims celebrating on 9/11 in New Jersey, that's just like a false thing that he made up. I mean, that was a big part of that campaign. The Muslim ban was a big part of that campaign. You don't have that without 9-11. And I think that's kind of been a sort of, between 9-11 and Trump's election, I think that was a particular era of politics. Frank, do you think for, for 2020 that we're in sort of a, a that uh, among the sort of attacks on institutions or sort of the break of norms, generally speaking, in the last two years creates a sort of different dynamic for identifying, selecting candidates, figuring out, even trying to predict sort of what might uh, rise and attach itself to? Uh... 100, well, 100%, I think you're going to see candidates running who would not have run in a different year. I mean, I think everyone looks at what happened in 2016 and the fact that Trump came out of, I mean, not nowhere in terms of being known, but came out of nowhere in terms of no one really believing that candidacy. When he came down that escalator, anyone who tells you, oh, I knew this was going to happen is <laughs> lying. Um, uh, no one really, no one really took it that seriously. They covered it because it was, as as I think you said, entertaining. 
Um, they covered it because it was colorful, but in the beginning, no one thought they were covering it because they were recording history in the making and the making of a president. Um, but I think you are gonna see, and in fairly short order in the next couple of months, you're gonna see people declaring candidacies who, I don't, who would not have in the absence of Donald Trump. Um, I, had, I had lunch the other day with um, the very young mayor of a not top tier city, um, and he was talking about the probability that he was gonna run for president. And I wanted to chuckle at first, and then I thought, well, of course he thinks, why not? Because A, the field is clearly gonna be so big that if you manage to just connect with 6% of the potential Democratic voters, and the field is 30 candidates, you're in the top three. You know, I mean, just do the arithmetic. So it's sort of a free-for-all, and it's a free-for-all that's abetted by the idea that Donald Trump upended all traditions, he upended all expectations, and one lesson we can carry away from that is don't make any assumptions about what voters will and won't connect with in a given, at a given moment in time. You, did, you wrote recently that, you know, the Democrats coming to Congress, Democrats in Washington, um, have to think in a lot of their calculations, what's good for 2020? Yeah. Uh, and so what is good for the Democrats in 2020? What should, how sh should they be thinking? I think, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of, of how um, committed versus overzealous they are in their investigations and their subpoenas. Mm -hmm. I think, and this again uh, is dovetails with people wanting temperature turned down, I think it has been a long time since Americans have looked to Washington and felt like they were seeing people trying to govern in a mature fashion. And I think uh, they're not going to get legislation through because Donald Trump's going to veto you know, most or all of it. But I think if Americans look at the Democratic caucus, now that they have House, House leadership, and they see a bunch of people seriously crafting pieces of legislation that do not seem so ideological they're doomed from the get-go, uh, that seem prudent, that seem to have been crafted with some sense of consensus in mind, if they see people trying reasonably, calmly to govern, I think that may be a model that they respond to. They'll understand if Democrats communicate carefully why it's not yielding dividends right away because there's somebody at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue who's using his veto pen. But I think if they keep that in mind, you know, let's model for voters what Washington might look like if we had the White House and the Senate and the House. Anish, so you recently wrote a profile of Kamala Harris. You cover uh, President Trump. If you were given an option of whose campaign you could cover, uh, what would you do? I mean, I have no idea because I just take orders. <laughs> I said I doubt that, but I. Uh, but how do you see how do you see the next two years unfolding from your your vantage point? Um, I think what Fra I would basically say what Frank said I think is dead on. Um, there's this idea that I think anyone and everyone feels empowered to run. I think had it. I, I look at the kind of Facebooks morphing into this almost villain-like character now, mainly because of a lot of the great reporting that the New York Times is doing, that's really pulling back the curtains on what is going on in the company, but he could, like the, the, the CEO of Facebook could easily have been someone who egg for the scene is running. Um, I think celebrities, of course, are looking at Donald Trump thinking, why can't I run if Donald Trump can run? Um, I was thinking about Oprah, just thinking about her, because she's <laughs> Oprah. Um, but, <laughs> You know, there are all these people that um, that want to run, but I think I think President Trump. The, what the lesson that the midterms taught President Trump was that you still go with your gut, you still go with your instincts over everyone else's. Republican consultants were probably saying, you know, let's try to maybe do a little bit less immigration, a little bit less. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about this big tax cut. And he was bored with that. He said, no one wants to come to a rally and cheer for tax cuts. They want to. They want to chant CNN sucks. They want to talk about the caravan. They want we want to give them things that feel like they are almost in a place that of fear and of anxiety where they need us to lead them. And I think that it worked. I talk. I've interviewed so many people who look at the president and think that he is all that he's saying is truth. All that he's saying is relevant. That people should be more worried about immigrants. Should be more worried about the way that America is changing. Um, and. In some ways, America is changing in this way where you, I interviewed a woman who said that she voted for Trump because she was getting picked up by, uh, uh, by at, at her place in Ohio and the taxi drivers were starting to become people of color and immigrants and she was bothered by that. And as a result, at like 90 years old, she was like, yeah, I have to keep thinking about Trump and he's, so, he's, he's what's right for this country. So I think that um, President Trump, if I, had to, if I had to predict, he's gonna keep that same playbook of race, of immigration, 
um, and of not listening to the Republican Party. And the Republican Party, I think, is going to get dragged along with him, and he's going to be dragging people on stage um, saying, you know, this guy, you, sh you should vote for him because he's going to support me in Washington. On the Democratic side, I imagine that um, they're going to try to make it a little bit less about Trump because, like I said, Hillary Clinton ran against Trump, ran against the anti-Trump, you don't want this person, he's unhinged, all those things, and President Trump really hasn't changed, so they're going to have to look at some playbook that isn't just centered on Trump. I think it'll be, I think there probably is going to be a pretty, it's going to be an interesting field in the sense that this is the first time, in a, like the last few times on the Democratic end, it's basically been a one-two. You have a choice between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, you have a choice between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. There were other people running, but like basically that's be what it became. That will not be the case this time. I mean, you probably, it, it is likely that like, for instance, you would have, if you're the kind of person who wanted to vote for Bernie Sanders, that you would also have a choice between Elizabeth Warren and Jared Brown. Um, you know, there will be, I think there, there, there will be multiple, I, I expect there will be multiple black candidates running for the, like that's kind of like a different thing. Um, there will be probably multiple Midwestern candidates running. There may be There's like multiple billionaires. <laughs> could be. Um, I don't know if the field's going to be as big as it. I do feel like there are going to be some people. I there's a version of events in my head where like it was this sweeping, decisive thing that happened a couple like last two weeks ago, and then you saw like Kamala Harris like being like I'm running for president on like the Thursday after the election. You know to kind of capital. You know just like let's move on to the next thing, and that's not. So far, what's happening? I think there, you know, there's definitely a smaller group of people. I think that people take perhaps more seriously because of their charisma and their current st like stature. Um, one thing that can't be, you know, Donald Trump was a very well known person, um, and that I think mattered to people. I mean, there there was a reason he always he basically always led in polls, um, the through pretty much throughout the um, 2016 primary. And I think at this point, a lot of people, there, it is very wide open. That's part of, I think that placeholder for Biden is probably a little bit soft, like Jeb Bush was, was last time. Do you think uh, President Trump will face a challenger uh, in his own primary? I don't think so. So with that, why don't we open it up for questions from the audience since we have some people live. Uh, do we have a mic and stuff like that for us? Thank you, John. First, a question for Frank. Uh, have you heard from Al Gore in the last two days? <laughs> uh, no, I have not. OK. And second question, broadly read, if you had to predict, will the Democrats' nominee end up being a centrist or one of the progressives? Which would you say it would be based on what you know now? And that's for all three of you. I'll, I'll go. Um, I, I think it will probably be a progressive. I don't like to, after 2016, I don't, like there was this meeting one day where somebody was making a point that I just really disagreed with, like a morning meeting, I was on the, I was called into it and I was like, Elizabeth Warren will be like a senator for the rest of her life if she wants to. And then afterwards I got a call that was like, you need to stop making predictions after 2016, we don't do that anymore and like, please just like ease it back. Um, I do think, I mean, one thing that that is very important for the democratic process is or for the democratic nominating process, it, nominating process is you just have it's a much more diverse group of people than than um, the, than on the Republican end, and like the kinds of voters who matter. Like there's like a like an older black woman is probably like the most important voter in the Democratic coalition, and like so it's like what what do those what what does she want? What does like maybe like a Midwestern woman who um, was a was maybe kind of an independent, but has now become like a real like kind of resistance like mom type voter. Like, what does she want? Like, those people will be really. It won't just be like who's the, who are the young people wanting. Like, it's not that's so much you know competition. Um, if I had to guess, I guess more progressive I, the, rather than centrist. I don't think it will be. I don't think it'll be a real centrist, but I also don't think like Hillary Clinton was not a, did not run a centrist campaign in 2016. She ran very on a very liberal platform. So, I'm not sure. I feel like her. I, I go back to what Frank said about candidates mattering, and I think that 
I can tell you that I think the person, I think that the person who wins the Democratic nomination is going to be a really good candidate and someone who connects with people and someone who is very much themselves and has receipts, quote unquote, um, of who they are that will go back to not just the last two years of their life. I think, I always think of Doug Jones because people were like, oh my God, black women came out for him. And I was like, have you seen A Time to Kill? Like he's basically that man. Like <laughs> he is, he studied the, he studied this bombing that killed four women and then proceeded to prosecute those people. This is not just some guy who black people are like, oh, okay, we'll have to vote for him because we don't like this other candidate. He was someone who showed an interest in African-American and civil rights and then proceeded to run. So I think that whoever runs is gonna really have to say, this is what I was doing in 1990. This is what I was doing in 2000. And it's going to be someone like that. First, I just want to thank you all for doing this. Uh, this has been really enlightening. Um, Yamish, I want to ask you, um, and I saw this when you were at the New York Times and you were in the documentary, The Fourth Estate. When you go out and you report and somebody says something that is um, wrong, where they're clearly indicating a misconception about something, you talked about talking to the retirees in Florida. How, how often do you say, well, no, that's wrong. You know, you're, you've got some real misconceptions about these people. Um, or, or do you just kind of let them talk? Or how, how do you handle a situation like that? I would say 90% of the time I let people talk because I think my job as a reporter is really to collect the information and not to change people's minds. But I will tell you a story in Milwaukee. I was in Milwaukee and I was interviewing this guy and asking him about like President Trump and what he thought about him. Actually, it was north of Milwaukee in this town that was like 97% white. And he, the guy, I was in, interviewing him about like healthcare or some policy thing. And he kept on saying, well, people think I'm racist. And he said it like three times. And I was like, finally, fine, sir. Like, <laughs> why do people think you're racist? <laughs> and he said, well, it's because I just don't think black people like to work. I just don't think that, I think this town has too many of them. And I just think that like, you know, they're just, they're just a problematic population essentially. And I said, well, you know, your town's 97% white, so... Like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, but there are more of them showing up to my job and I don't know where they're coming from. And he was like, and look at you, like you work for the New York Times and your parents probably didn't even have a college degree. And you know, like, and like, and black women just love to have kids without having dads. And I, like, I literally felt my mom like tap me on the shoulder, like, yeah, nah. And I remember like <laughs> having to be like, sir, excuse me, but actually just talked about my mother. And anyone who knows me knows I'm really close to my mom. So actually, my mom has a PhD, and my dad also has a PhD. So that's two black people with a PhD. <laughs> and you, you, you are actually wrong about your, your perceptions of African Americans. And by the way, I'm a working black woman. Like, so I am working right now. Um, so I think, so I thought that was like a chance where it's like, it has to be very personal for me to, I think, get. To, I think, I feel like I have to, I have to say that, like, Mark Sanford said that Haitian babies, or something in version of Haitian babies, that, like they shouldn't really have a right to be Americans. And I'm Haitian, and I'm that Haitian baby that literally was born in America and was American because I was born here. I would be Haitian if my parent, if, if birthright citizenship wasn't a thing. So I think that's another case where you have to educate people and say, well, why do you think I have less rights to be here than my friend whose parents are Italian and German? Like they, white people might now have become white people, but let's remember the history of what white became. It was Irish and French and German and black people, they, we never really got that same thing. We still are like Nigerian or Haitian and we just didn't get the same thing. And then of course, let's not talk about the po large population of, Afri of Africans that were taken here and never still quite got to be American because they're all hyphenated for the rest of their lives um, as African-Americans. So I think that in that case, I feel like I felt a particular edge to be like, actually, sir. Um, but I think for most part, the, for the most part, you want to know what people actually think. And if you start confronting people, they get defensive and they think that they don't want to tell you what they think. So when I'm in that um, retirement home and the woman saying Puerto Ricans shouldn't vote and, and that it's preposterous that they can come here, I don't need to tell you that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. It's like the, the viewers will figure that out. Um, I'm more here to let you be exactly who you want to be. <clears throat> so you had talked about the White House press room and the uh, dynamics there and the challenges of that room. Um, um, and you said that Trump likes to fight. 
Um, it's very frustrating as a member of the public to see Trump controlling the media agenda as he does uh, successfully. So um, why is it that the um, media or the Democratic Party can't engage in a different way and sort of do a, a judo thing with them? Um, um, you, could, uh, you could put up a Democratic op opponent not to run against him, but to explicitly fight with him. So you actually charge someone in the Democratic Party with the responsibility to engage him and, and, and get him rattled, while the rest of the Democrats are doing something more meaningful onto the side. I'd like your response to, to that suggestion. <laughs> I, I, I have a second one, though, as well. Uh, you had said, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenges of the journalists in the room. Um, how about trying to find someone that you would deliberately put into the press room who wasn't a journalist, but would excite the attention gene in Trump? <laughs> so uh, you, could, you could go and have a, a lunch with Taylor Swift <laughs> or Jamie Foxx, someone who, if they were in the press room with press credentials, Trump would know that they were left-wing leaning, but would be unable to resist engaging with those people because of the ratings. So what do you think of those ideas? Are you a television producer? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, that's, that's Twitter. I mean, that's, that is what he has often done. I actually thought, I mean, I actually thought, like a couple weeks ago when he was tweeting about the Dodgers, um, about the bullpen, decision for the Dodgers. I actually was expecting a lot more of that when he was president. Like I was like thought he would be like live tweeting the Oscars and stuff just to like kind of like because he knew it would get attention and stuff and there really hasn't been much of that. Um, I do I mean listen like I, I think one thing that comes up sometimes too is people get frustrated with the amount of coverage uh, and things that Trump starts like uh, specifically I was doing a panel last year and people were frustrated with the amount of coverage on um, kneeling and the anthem. And that kind of Trump had started that in, in the sense of that he had brought it up at a, a rally and basically called Colin Kaepernick a son of a bitch. Um, but the thing about the, all of that stuff in my experience, and this is part of, I think, possibly some of the audience that BuzzFeed, ser BuzzFeed News serves, is that so much of what is kind of deemed sometimes as a distraction is actually stuff that people care a lot about, um, particularly in presidential campaign politics. You have something where it's like, um, like a social issue or a third rail thing, something that people have really strong felt opinions about and are sometimes complicated and conflicting, um, intersects with politics and it results in this explosion. And I think, I mean, I think some of the kneeling is that, which is like people protesting police violence and then also that being sort of conflated with other things and kind of confusingly explained and then also Trump like just you know tossing gasoline on that and then the economics of the sport and NFL concussions like all of it just coming together in one place and there's quite a bit that people really care about there so it's like how much of it is a distraction and how much of it is just sort of a reflection of what people are actually interested in. Can I add one thing? Because the, the very, very legitimate complaint comes up all the time that we in the media, we in the print media, we in the TV media, um, give way too many print inches or television space to Trump, and we do. Um, but I don't know if readers and viewers understand how much responsibility they have here. And what I mean by that is we live, this was not true when I got into journalism, it wasn't even true, I think, 10 years ago. We live in an era now where the way you are consuming your media can be measured precisely and in real time. We know how, how many of you click on a given article. We know whether you came to it um, from a mobile phone or from the website or some other way. We know how deep into the article you got, how many minutes you spent on it. Um, all of these metrics are extremely sophisticated, extremely precise, and the same thing holds true to a slightly lesser degree for television. So I would say to people who would say, how come I read um, 20 times as much more about Donald Trump than I did about John Kasich? Because you were clicking on the Donald Trump articles and you weren't clicking on John Kasich. And if, if news consumers began behaving differently, if they realized how much 
how were they having this equation, and they began behaving differently, they would be shocked at how quickly the news would change because guess what? We want eyeballs, and we will do to some measure what you tell us you want from us. And so clearly we're being told, even as people are complaining about Donald Trump's dominance, we're being told, give us more of that because it's kind of entertaining. Now the flip of that is that, like, because I don't actually want to read about Trump all the time. Um, like all this, this past week, it was like, I've read like a lot about Trump's mood, um, which seems like, it just seems like a lot. Um, but uh, the, the flip of that is like sometimes thinking about, it's like, where we don't want to do, like if we want to do stories, and this I think will come up a little bit with the 2020 campaign on the Democratic end. Eventually people will be really immersed in that and care and want to read a profile about a lot of different people, but maybe not as much right now even. Um, that's finally starting to pick up. But it's kind of like thinking about like as though like an asteroid hit Earth, and then like you can still do a story about the town over here near the asteroid, but you just sort of have to like acknowledge that like life has changed since the asteroid hit Earth, and like kind of in court, you got to like think about it that way in terms of like a hook. But like people do want to read about other things, but like I don't know, people really want to read a lot about Trump. Is that's the they like the, they like the asteroid, yeah. Yeah. Is I also think that there's been a change in terms of how his rallies are covered and how his tweets are covered. Yeah. I think at first reporters are like, okay, he tweeted this morning, like this is going to be the lead of the story. How do we do this? There were morning reporters dedicated to writing about these morning tweets. And then after a while, people were like, oh, I'm not writing about that tweet. Like, I'm just not writing about it. It just is like something that's passing. Um, and some of that, sometimes you can ignore that. Sometimes it becomes a transgender policy change. And that was a real thing that he was thinking about that became policy. So it is a delicate balance. Um, I would say birthright citizenship. I had conversations about whether or not, like, oh, is this a real thing? And it's like, well, maybe it isn't a real thing, but, like, the conversation is traumatizing for a whole section of the population. So I, could, as a reporter, couldn't feel like I could just ignore it. I would say with his rallies, even Fox News isn't covering them live anymore because people have realized that at some point, a, covering a stump speech becomes, like, viewers do not want to watch that, and they rather watch Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson um, talk about whatever they talk, are going to talk about versus hearing President Trump go on for an hour and a half about all sorts of different topics. So I think that we've figured that out as a, as a medium, how to be like, okay, we need to do the better job at this. There was a... Hi. Hi. I'll have um, to make this the last one, too. Oh, I'm sorry. No. But, <laughs> oh, we have another one after that? Okay. Well, Cheers. Yeah. Just to Frank's point there, I'm concerned with that premise where it's all about money. We're going to get Kim Kardashian as our next president because people want to see pictures Strange, of her. Stranger things have already happened. They, well, <laughs> yeah, but at, at what point, I'm a journalist, at what point is it our responsibility to, regardless of the money, regardless of the economics, regardless of the clicks, to focus on the stories that truly have an impact on people's lives? And there are metrics to be able to decide what truly has an impact on people's lives. So at what point do journalists make the decision, you know what, this is fancy and glittery and shiny, but we're not going to chase that rabbit. We're going to focus on the issues that matter. You know, I think about the New York Times massive investigative report on his tax, right. his family's tax fraud, and we just didn't even talk about it. In fact, he tweeted that it was boring. And that kind of ended up being what that story was. It was just boring. The New York Times even made cliff notes for people, just like, please, yeah, this no. is Although an interesting you gotta story. You got to do the cliff notes because otherwise somebody else will do it. It's actually not a bad, it's, that's a good strategy to do. You well, want to do, because like, is. you know, it's a commitment to read like a I, I'm not thousand. saying okay. it's a bad yeah. strategy. I'm just <laughs> saying that I think it's a fantastic strategy. I think it's a sad strategy yeah. that people won't sad, read it. But, yeah. but I just wonder, you know, we have to really think about the future of journalism We're, instead okay. of thinking about clicks, right? Well, the Times is a good example because if you if you go to our website at any given moment or pick up any day's paper, you're going to see more stories driven by the question, what do people need to know, than you are going to see stories driven by how do we get eyeballs. But it is a balance, because if you don't get enough of the eyeballs, you can't keep the Baghdad Bureau open, because that's a really expensive thing to do. And if you look, if you step back and you look at the expanse of journalism, in fact, one of the reasons why journalism is so dominated right now by riffing 
as opposed to shoe leather reporting is because it costs nothing to put somebody at a laptop in their kitchen and have them look at the already gathered facts and come up with a riff. It costs a lot of money to send them out on a campaign trail to have them find out how a new healthcare policy is working out in a given space. So what I'm talking about is that side of the business which will always exist and which has to exist to fund the other side. In that elective eyeball driven side, if audiences would think harder about the effect of the clicks they're doing, um, it would help us come up with a product that had more of what you're talking about and even less of the candy. Um, I will also say, well, one, Linda's my best friend. She <laughs> went to Georgetown together. Um, <laughs> and she's an anchor at WRAL and do, is doing amazing work. And she's Emmy nominated now, so I'm going to say that too. Um, <laughs> um, and I feel like, to me, this is where local news and um, and our responsibility as journalists come in. I remember when I was working at the Miami Herald uh, for a couple summers, I was showing my mom all these like fancy kind of sensational stories. Like I made the front page today. I'm 17. I'm covering a murder. And then I wrote this story about like how to prepare your pool for the hurricane and like didn't even think about it. Like I was like, clearly she's not going to want that. I literally came home to like, it cut out. My byline was gone. She had it on the fridge and I was like, oh, you cut out my article. And she was like, oh, you wrote that? <laughs> like <laughs> she was like, she's like, well, this is really the only thing I need to read for the rest of the summer because it's the most important thing. And it, it, it was a check on me to be like, people need information. My husband works in local news. He works for Loudoun County and they're doing his, they're doing really great work about the school system there and the fact that teachers are assaulting it, students and multiple teachers are being fired because they're not taking care of these kids or they're they're overseeing all sorts of weird things that the kids are doing or have inappropriate relationships with the children and you realize that there was this whole gutting of local news where papers lost their state reporters or their county reporters um and it's, it's really, in some ways, really sad. And it, it reminds me, as a national reporter, that we need to be focused on those stories, too, because it's so important to people to make sure that how you, how you pay your taxes, how your kids go to school, um, what your kids are learning in school, um, that those are things that, that people need to know about and that we need to be paying attention to. I'm a White House reporter, but when I took the job at PBS, I told them, you know, I want to cover the White House, but I also want to be on the ground talking to real people. My idea of covering the White House isn't just sitting in the press briefing room. That's just like not where my spirit is. It's not why I got into the into the the craft. So I've been lucky to be able to go out and do stories about um, like a, there's what I did a story about like immig immigrants that are basically being put on hold as the army um, needs recruits as people are being sent back to Iraq and Afghanistan four or five times. We have DACA recipients who have signed up who who have all these who have, who have done all the paperwork who the government just doesn't want to have in the in the army. I felt really proud that I had the space to do that story, and it reminds me that in four years or in two years when journalists look up, we all want to be able to look up and say, I'm proud of something that I did. And it would be scary to me if I looked up in four years after covering President Trump and I had nothing that I wanted to show my mom. I had nothing that I wanted to put on the wall because that to me means that you just kind of got into this wheel. And it's really easy to get in that wheel, but I think as journalists, we have to resist the urge to always want to be there. And it's anxiety inducing when you're off doing a story about education and like there's somebody else, President Trump tweets something and you're like, oh my God, I should be there. I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm, but I'm here. Um, it's something that I think journalists have to work against. I, the, the, and just to echo on that particular point, I think the, like the last five years, uh, we've put a premium on publishing fairly ambitious features about political figures and different things in politics. Um, and sometimes, and that's like always sort of a risky endeavor because sometimes they don't turn out. You spend a lot of time on something and it doesn't turn out like you want it to necessarily, but we've had some that really have done quite well. And um, most of them really aren't about Trump. Um, uh, McKay Coppins, when he was at BuzzFeed, wrote two great pieces about Trump. But, um, you know, Rosie Gray wrote great pieces about the the all right when it was starting to bubble up. Um, uh, we have a reporter, Darren Sands, who wrote great profiles of Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams, much more, like way before people were talking about them quite a bit. Um, one of my favorite pieces we've ever published is a, a piece about the aftermath of the 2016 election about a staffer who works, who still works for Hillary Clinton and answering the mail that she uh, received after the election. Basically, she received like about 100,000 letters. 
and just sort of processing what a loss of an election looks like and also kind of like the end of a political era. Um, and like those pieces, like they're all like, there's a part of Trump in some of that, but they're not necessarily the focus of it. And I think they're definitely things that those reporters, when they like step away from it, have that thing where it's like, ah, well, we did this and I feel really good about this. And I think readers like those pieces too. And that's kind of, those, that's the happy thing. You want like a piece you feel really good about that you feel like was of quality and value that readers also enjoyed and also a lot of readers read them too. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you for being here and join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Mm -hmm.